thank you so much for having me. I actually, this is uh, not the first time I've been on the stage. I produced a show that was on this very stage in 2013 called Somewhere in Time. Anybody see it? <laughs> so today we're going to talk about failure. <laughs> now, I'm thrilled to be back in Portland. Uh, I spent about four to five weeks here creating that musical. We create musicals out of town, and then we get them to Broadway, or not. Uh, and I remember getting here and talking to a lot of you and just being amazed at the people, the environment, the arts, and I just went, I remember going up to someone and being like, this, this place is amazing, Portland is incredible. And they were like, yeah, yeah, do us a favor, when you get back to New York, do not tell anybody that. We don't want any more of you out here. Uh, so, no, seriously, thank you for having me. Uh, I've, I'm having a lot of fun so far, and uh, I speak at a lot of conferences, and if you promise not to tell the other conferences, I will tell you that this is one of the coolest ones I've ever been to. Uh, I want a, a big shout out to the creators of CreateCon. Yeah. For all you entrepreneurs or creators out there, I'm sure you can understand this feeling that sometimes it can feel very lonely doing what we do. And to be in a room of 500 other like-minded, passionate people who want to create something is just really fun for me. And kudos to you for showing up uh, in a world in 2019 when it's so easy to stay at home and connect with people. Uh, to know how important it is to actually get in a room and connect with people in person and face to face. That's an incredible, incredible asset and you owe yourself a pat on the back for showing up today. Uh, so all that aside, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, you're probably wondering, I will tell you that I wear a lot of hats, okay? I do a lot of things in the business, um, but here's that very typical introductory slide that exists in all PowerPoint. So uh, you've heard some of it, yes, I've won a couple Tony Awards. I've raised over $50 million to produce the 25 shows that I've done. I was recently named to the Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing companies in the U.S. and one of the, one of the first Broadway producer uh, to be assigned to that list. So I was proud of that one. Um, yes, pretty good. My mission, as you'll hear about later, is to get the arts and the theater everywhere I can. So the fact that I can get on that list with all those other advertising agencies and companies meant a lot to me. So uh, I am Andrew Lake executive producer, so that means no cat's jokes, I don't want to hear them. Uh, <laughs> He's listening, trust me. Uh, I'm also a new dad and a mediocre golfer who dreams of playing Augusta National someday. So if anyone out there can hook me up, I'd appreciate it. Uh, the fact of the matter, all these resume credits aside, what I really do is I create stuff. That's what I do. So to give you an example, I've created a whole bunch of off-Broadway and Broadway shows, came up with the idea myself, wrote several of them, and then got them produced and onto an off-Broadway or Broadway stage. I did create the only Broadway board game that's out there right now. It's called Be a Broadway Star, and it's one of the top-selling Broadway gifts on Amazon.com. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff Bezos. Uh, I created an app uh, to tell you what was at the TKTS booth in Times Square. It made the Entertainment Weekly must list in 2010. I created an award-winning web series called The Bunny Hole. I created a blog, a podcast, and a membership forum where a whole bunch of people can get together and talk about how to get their ideas for shows off the ground. I created a documentary. I created a bunch of books. I create stuff. That's what I do. I create a lot of stuff, okay? And at first glance, all those things may seem different. Yeah, they're the, under the umbrella of the theater industry, of the entertainment industry, but what the heck does a Broadway show and an app and a board game have in common? Well, I'm here to tell you that every single thing I've created, everything, has one thing in common. And I want to share that with you today in the hopes that it will help you create whatever it is you want to create. Whether it's something on your own, or whether it's just an idea in whatever company you're working for. Okay? I started my career in management of Broadway shows. I worked on over 10 big Broadway shows. I was a staffer. I got a paycheck. I was that guy. All the while dreaming about producing and being what I call an entrepreneur, combining business and the arts. My career as a staffer led me to be in touch with this man. So this is Hal Prince. Hal Prince is one of the most celebrated people in the theatrical industry. He's got like 174 Tony Awards. Very timely, Hal just passed away just a few, few weeks ago. He's also watching. Uh, he's an amazing man, everything from the original, pretty produced West Side Story, originally Sweeney Todd, he directed, and of course, Phantom of the Opera. 
his biggest hit. So in the 90s, Hal wrote this very famous article, how there were no more creative producers anymore. Creative producer, right? Exactly what I wanted to do. And he said there were only check writers, there were only financers. And I went up to Hal, literally I had the opportunity to work with him three times. I ran up to him and I said, Hal, this is what I want to do. I want to create stuff. I want to create things. Can you help me? And he said, yes, not now. I'm teching Act 2 of Candide. I really can't help you at the moment. But come to my office. He was a very generous man. So I went to his office. And in his office, I pitched him every idea I had ever had for the show. <laughs> every one. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which has actually since become a musical. I think I would have done a bit of a better job. But that's between us. Uh, I also pitched him a musical based on this book called The Mole People, which is about uh, the homeless population that lives in the subway tunnels of New York City. It's probably the worst idea for a musical ever. <laughs> and Hal listened. Uh, and in about my 15th pitch, he stopped me. And Hal said, Ken, do you remember the first show I ever produced? And I said, no. And he said it was the pajama game. Don't come out of the box trying to produce West Side Story, Ken. Be happy if you get the pajama game. Ran for a couple years, made people laugh, made me a little money, and it got me started. West Side Story was my third show. So this thought rang so true in my head, because look, I was in my early 20s, and something that many young men have in common in their early 20s is they think they know it all, and they think they can change the world. And the fact is, I was not ready to produce Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And I was not ready to do those things. And Hal's advice as I was running out the door was, Ken, just do something. Produce anything. Get started. So I went home that day, and I started work on an idea that I had years before, but I actually didn't think was important enough to start. It wasn't what I wanted on my tombstone. It wasn't West Side Story. And that idea was based on a small interactive show called Tony and Tina's Wedding. People know the show, it's a live show. Oh yeah, I've been, right? Uh, it's an Italian wedding, you dance with the bride, you eat cake, you have a good old time. So Tony and Tina's Wedding had been ripped off like 17 times. Joey and Maria's wedding, there was Grandma Sylvia's funeral, there was Bernie's bar mitzvah. So they were just like one after the other. So the business guy in me said, there's obviously something about these realities shows, right? Something about these interactive shows that audiences enjoy. And they're all about milestone events in people's lives. So what's a milestone event in my life that I could base a show on? Well, what about the prom? Prom's a big moment in a lot of Americans' lives. You're turning 18, you're going off to college, your first formal dance, etc. Well, that seemed interesting, but wasn't interesting enough. And then I thought, what if I said it when I went to the prom? What if I said it in the 80s? <laughs> So all of a sudden, I had this idea for this interactive show set at a high school prom in 1989 that we ended up calling Wanna Get High. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, usually it takes a little bit for that one to roll. I thought Portland would get that much sooner than we don't but apparently not. Um, so there I was, I had this idea. This interactive show set at a high school prom in 1989. And I said, Hal's told me to do something, do anything, so I'm gonna do it. I sat down, popped open my laptop, and I stared at that blank screen and that blinking cursor <laughs> that just haunts you. <laughs> it's like a metronome, right? Write something, write something. And the fact of the matter is, that is when I knew I didn't know what to do because I had never done this before. And I sat there, paralyzed, because I didn't know what to do, right? And this is the moment. So this is it. This is the moment that separates leaders from followers, creators from consumers. For all you entrepreneurs out there, or people that want to create, this is that pivotal fork in the road. What are you going to do at this moment? How are you going to get through and create something? You have that choice, or you have the choice to not and stand absolutely still and do nothing. And this shit is hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's what Peter Thiel talks about in his book, Zero to One. Anyone read this book? I strongly encourage anyone that wants to make anything read this book. Fantastic study 
of going from nothing, zero to one. It's much easier to go from one to two. And I was just reading an article, this isn't in my planned uh, speech, but I was just reading an article about how many Game of Thrones fans out there, right? Game of Thrones, yes. I was reading an article about how tourism among the sites where they shot it spiked. Right? All these businesses are being created off the back of Game of Thrones. That's one to two. George Martin created Game of Thrones, went from zero to one. That's the hard part, right? That's the hard part. Well, I'm gonna teach you how to do that with a very simple method that I use that's that one thing that I have in common with everything I've created. How I do it? I play tennis. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about going to a tennis court and like all of a sudden I'm just gonna hit ball and then I'll get divinely inspired to create something new. That's not what I did. And I'll tell you how I created the Awesome Age Prom. This is that show that I was talking about. This is what it became. Using this entrepreneurial method that I call serve the tennis ball. That's what I do. So I sat there and I thought at my empty desk and that blinking cursor, I need to start this process of creating this show. And I know it's gonna be based on improv. Right? I know there's going to be actors roaming about, so I need actors. Okay, I know I'm in New York City, actors are everywhere. <laughs> so if I place an ad in the local trade paper looking for actors, I know that I will get flooded with pictures and resumes, and they will stack on my deck. And I'm a little bit OCD, I'm a little bit anal retentive, I can't have anything on my desk at the end of the day, it has to be cleaned off. If I have a stack of pictures and resumes, I'll have to do something about it. So what I did was serve the tennis ball. It cost me $35 and about 15 minutes to write an ad that was placed in backstage. And sure enough, later that week, my desk is stacked with 100 pictures and resumes from hopeful actors all over the city. They hit the tennis ball back to me. So then what did I do? Well, I had to sort them into two piles, actors I was interested in, actors I was not interested in, and I had to call them in for an audition. And then they had to show up. And then I had to cast them. And then I had to have a first rehearsal. And there I was, in the McDonald's, at the basement level of the rehearsal studio, 20 minutes before the first rehearsal began, reading a book called How to Improv. <laughs> because I didn't know what the F I was doing. At this moment, I had no script, no character list, nothing but this idea. But all of a sudden, I was about to meet 19 other people that were there to talk about the 80s prom project that I held those auditions for. I served the tennis ball, and it got me to that point, that point. By focusing what I knew how to do, I accomplished what I did not know how to do. I placed an ad, I had an audition, I got people in a room. So much of what I do now is just simply that, getting people in a room. And slowly, rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal, the next thing you knew, I had a show. And the Awesome 80s Prom ended up running for 10 years in New York City. It's now performed all over the country, it's been done all over the world, including, by the way, in Korea, and they don't even have proms in Korea. <laughs> and that never would have happened without that first $35 ad in backstage. Serve the tennis ball, back it comes, serve it again. It's also physics. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So through this process, I discovered the secret <laughs> the secret to creating something new is not knowing what you're doing. That's it. That's the secret. You remember the podcast I told you about? So I've interviewed about 200 of the most powerful people in the entertainment industry. From the president of NBC, to Oscar winners, to Pulitzer Prize winners, to Tony winners, to celebrities, all of them. You know what the most commonly uttered phrase is? I didn't know what I was doing. That's what they say when they get started. 
not knowing what you're doing is an asset and not a liability in creating something brand new. And I can prove it. Remember these folks? Not one of them knew what they were doing. Not one. You know how we know that? They created something that never existed before. They were new products, they were new things. There were things that blow us away because they weren't around before. They couldn't know what they were doing. But by focusing on one step after another, by focusing on the things they knew how to do, eventually they got to a place where they created something brand new. And look, I talked about being hard before. It's not only hard, it's scary, right? It's frightening to create something new. In fact, I believe there are only two things out there that prevent people from getting what they want. Only two. Number one, they don't want it badly enough. And I'm gonna tell you that this number one does not apply to any single person in this room, I know that. I know that because I've talked to many of you, I've watched you, I was roaming around just watching the passion on your faces, and you're also here. You actually served the tennis ball. Actually, the creator served it for you on CreateCon. You hit it back to them. You showed up. You're spending your time, your money, your energy being here in this room. So number one doesn't apply. All that's left is number two, and it's tough love time. For those of you who want to make something, there's a little bit of fear. Just a little bit of fear preventing you from going to zero to one. And I get it. I am scared all the freaking time. All the freaking time. I'm scared of failing, right? I'm scared of, I've raised $50 million. I lose people's money. <laughs> Broadway has a success rate of one out of five. I'm afraid of asking for money sometimes. I'm afraid of being teased on social media. We're all afraid of these things, right? Try being a Broadway producer and have to face the New York Times critic. You wanna talk about fear, I get it. So we have to develop systems on how to hack that fear. Right? And how you hack it is you focus on the things you're actually not afraid of. Those little things. You serve the tennis ball. You just hit the tennis ball across that net and wait for somebody to hit it back to you. And if they don't, you serve it again. You keep hitting and hitting and hitting. One small thing after another, after another, after another, after another. And I promise you, if you do that, there will come a time in your life when you are somewhere that you never imagined you'd be. But this is two years ago. This is when I won the Tony Award for Once on the Side. Of course, this was a dream I've had since I was a little kid, right? I don't remember anything about this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Actually, I remember like running up to the stage and seeing Tina Fey's leg and being like, that's Tina Fey's leg. Like, that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. <clears throat> but when I got to the stage, I will tell you, there's one moment right before I spoke, and I've, I've since watched my speech, but right before I spoke, there's a moment where you can see me take a second before my mouth opened. And I remember thinking, as I stared at it over the thousands of people in that room, and thought about the millions of people watching, and I thought, how did I get here? I don't get it. Looking back now, I know I got there by serving the tennis ball. Very quickly, for once on this island, the tennis ball was, I worked with an incredible director named Michael Arden. At the opening of our show, Spring Awakening, I went to Michael and I said, what do you want to do next? And he said, once on this island. And I said, I'll ask the authors tomorrow. And they said, let's get together and talk about it. And all of those little things led to this moment. And when Michael asked me, I never thought, oh, we're gonna win a Tony for this one day. You can't think about that stuff. You can't think about making millions of dollars. You can't think about any of it. You can only think about just hitting that tennis ball over the net. So here's my challenge for you, for all those who wanna create something, whether it's inside a company, whether it's outside a company, whether it's a script, whether it's an app, whether it's anything, any idea you've ever had, and I know you have them, I know you have ideas for screenplays or novels or inventions. I'm working with Joy Mangano, who invented the Miracle Moth for creating a musical on her life. I know everyone has these ideas. So my challenge for you is this. What's one thing you can do today to move your project forward? One thing. What's one simple thing? How can you serve the tennis ball? Anyone ever have an idea for an app? Anyone not do anything about it? Here's what you're going to do. Here's a simple one. 
Go on to Fiverr, Upwork, any of the freelance sites, post a proposal, and say what you want out of your app. Because even if you don't know how to create an app, someone will respond and say, I know how to create this. That's all you need to do. Join a writer's group. It's as easy as Google. Remember I said, boy, I built that board game? You know what the tennis ball was for that? Google how to make a board game. <laughs> if I had never done that, the thing wouldn't be on Amazon today. There is incredible potential in this room. Incredible potential. I know it because I've been roaming the halls, I've been watching, I've been listening. And there's one thing I hate more in the world is that it's unrealized potential. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to your idea to take that one little step and watch what happens afterwards. Because here's the thing about ideas. They're actually worth nothing. Zero. Everyone can have an idea. Not everyone can make it happen. Proof that an idea is worth nothing, you can't copyright them. You can't. They're not protected by law. They're only protected when you make something from the idea. And as you make something, as you do something, if ever along that process you find yourself saying, I don't know what the F I'm doing, you should smile. Because that's when you know you're onto something amazing. Thank you very much.